first, I would like to introduce our guest today, uh, Becky Oaks. Oaks is a retired educator and executive director of the Missouri State High School Activities Association, as well as a retired NFHS director of sports. Oaks spent 24 years at the MSHSAA, 14 of those as the executive director. In that leadership role, Oaks served as just the second female to be named director of a state high school association on a full-time basis. In 1993, she began her term on the NFHS Board of Directors and became the first female president of the NFHS Board of Directors in 1996. Oaks joined the NFHS staff in 2006, serving as a director of sports, overseeing track and field, cross country, volleyball, gymnastics, water polo, and swimming and diving. Did I get them all? Is that all? I believe so. Okay. Inclusion somewhere. Yeah, in addition, Oaks directed the task force on inclusion and created the NFHS Inclusion of Students with Disability team that still exists today. Oaks officially retired in 2017. Today, you can still find Oaks uh, active in the interscholastic activity space where she volunteers for the MSHSAA, co-hosts Talking Women's Sports Radio Show, and participates in a high school mentoring program, uh, as well as spending lots of time with her granddaughters. Uh, so thanks for joining me here this morning, Becky. Glad to be here, Lindsay. Good to see you again. <laughs> you as well. Um, I've had the pleasure of knowing you since since really you joined the NFHS staff. I joined soon after um, and learned everything I know from you. So I'm excited to be able to ask you some questions and dig in a little deeper. So first, I want to go back. Uh, can you tell me how you found sports as a young girl in the 1960s in Rolla, Missouri, and what role sports played in your life back then? You know, we lived sort of out, uh, not really in the country, but out, didn't live in a neighborhood. And uh, the neighboring boys were around and we just played. Uh, and so the, the big games began, you know, playing baseball, playing touch football, riding our bikes. And my dad was a avid St. Louis Cardinals fan. And um, that was on Sunday afternoons, that was kind of our highlight. We would always go fishing together and listen to the Cardinal baseball. And then every now and then we, you know, we pick up two or three games in St. Louis. So it, it just started by neighborhood play, I suppose. And it just was so much fun. And then the other was I found in my PE classes in elementary school, you know, how cool is that having recess all the time? So it, it just kind of grew and it seemed like it was just a good fit. So when you got to high school, uh, what did athletic competition look like for you? What kind of opportunities were available uh, for you at that age? Through the high school, zero. We were right, right, right before kind of the Title IX uh, was implemented. Uh, we didn't even have intramurals until my senior year. And um, so it, we anything we played, we played outside of school. So we played on a traveling softball team. Um, there was a group of us. We were really lucky. It started when we were in junior high. There were some young teachers that loved just playing basketball, playing volleyball, and they would open the gym and had a group of about six or eight of us that we would come in and play basketball with them and play volleyball. So they actually, you know, kind of gave us that opportunity that we didn't have anywhere else. So our senior year, uh, we had, I think maybe, I'll say it diplomatically, we had um, discussed with our administration on numerous occasions uh, the need to have girls sports. And so we did get intramurals at that time. And then after we graduated the next year, uh, the high school put in girls sports. So out, out of school, but not so much in school. So you were able to form um, a, another a group of another group of women at that time, or young girls at that time, uh, your age, who were all kind of fighting for the same thing, same opportunity? We were sassy, feisty girls, and there were uh, a really, what I would say is some really good athletes at that time in our class, the class above us and the class below us, and uh, everybody just kind of banded together, and our parents were with us, you know, they they kind of said, go for it, um, left it up to us to do that. And so we just tried, really, we tried every avenue. We went, we were all active in student government. So we tried to go kind of that route with it. Uh, we met with the principal. We 
talked about it and um, you know eventually they put in the intramurals and it just in our particular area of the state um, girls sports was just it was not popular in some areas of the state they had basketball for a long long time but we just were not in an area where that that was popular so we were you know we were kind of uh, forging ahead I suppose. So as you mentioned, uh, 1972 was really the passage of Title IX was uh, the summer before you started your freshman year in college, uh, and you did participate in sports in college. So was that um, a result of Title IX, or can you kind of talk through how you were able to get an opportunity in college to play, and if Title IX played a role in that? Well, you know, um, I went to at Missouri State University, which was Southwest Missouri State uh, University at that time, but... Um, when we started, they had they had had women's sports. They were a member of the AIAW, which was uh, kind of the precursor to uh, the NCAA doing anything with with uh, women's sports. So the sports programs existed. And during the summer, there was um, a team in Springfield called Foremost Softball. And they were kind of like the premier soft, women's softball team, one of them in, in the state of Missouri. And a lot of players on that team all played softball for the university. So we would, my dad would take me and we would go to tournaments and watch and play and everything like that. And so it just seemed like a natural, you could try out scholarships didn't exist at the time. So you could try out for these teams. And so they had, uh, uh, I met a senior and she kind of took me on her wing and she said, you know, you come with me and uh, you're, you're going to, you're going to try out for field hockey and the, uh, uh, another one said, come on, we're, we're going to, you know, we're going to play volleyball. And then, of course, the softball. And so at that time, you didn't have to really specialize as much. You played more than one sport uh, in college. And so I kind of had that opportunity. But it was older, older uh, women there in the school, student that encouraged us to play, several of us. And we got the opportunity and it just kind of kept growing from there. So when do you feel like you started to see the impact of Title IX? I, I think we began to see it. Um, it was coming. I think my my freshman year in college really began to settle in that you saw this Title IX, the schools were starting, you know, high schools were starting to look at programs. But playing at the college and seeing what you could do. And I, I, you know, I feel very good about the experiences that I had there and the way the university treated the female athletes at that time. I mean, there was lots to be done. Uh, don't get me wrong there, but they weren't, uh, you know, putting thumbs down on things uh, to, to do that. And so I think my introduction to Title IX was a positive introduction. Um, we weren't fighting, fighting. We were changing things. So um, that, that's when I think I really saw it. It was in college and the opportunities that we got to play and just seeing how high schools all around, you know, as we went through college, all, all around the area and the state were putting, you know, were putting in programs. And keep in mind, I was majoring in physical education. So every desire I had was to be a coach, uh, it, you know, so I was attuned to those things and I officiated uh, a lot through college. So um you know, just got to, what I would say, just got to see things begin to unfold. And some people had good experiences and some people not so good. Well, you led me right to my next question. I, I know that you realized from a young age that you wanted to be a physical education teacher. What drew you to education um, and really physical education at that? <laughs> well, it's not just to play all the time. <laughs> well, <laughs> almost. No, uh, my dad started out as a teacher. And so in our family, um, we were brought up that probably one of the most noble professions was to be a teacher. Uh, so I, I don't know, I just sort of gravitated to, I wanted to be a teacher. That's what I wanted to be. I never really wavered from that. It was easy to pick, you know, being a physical education um, instructor, a teacher, Started in the second grade. I, I don't embellish this story. I just, the way it is, you call them gym teachers back then. And my gym teacher was Coach West. And he was just the nicest man I think I'd ever met. Uh, and I thought, what a job this person has. He gets recess all day long. 
And since I loved recess, I thought, well, I'm, that's, a nat- that's a natural fit right there. So between kind of the influence of my parents and, uh, you know, the, the early years of teaching, I, it just, that was it. And I never, I never really um, went a different direction of, you know, well, maybe I should be this, maybe I should be that. So uh, when young people say, well, what did you do? How did you decide? I don't have some of the trials and tribulations of, you know, well, what should my major be? I just, I just knew. And I know during that time, uh, you were, obviously you mentioned officiating and then you also coached uh, track and field, volleyball and basketball. Is that correct? Yes. Mm-hmm. Um, so in those positions, um, what do you feel like you learned the most uh, from the athletes that you were able to touch from the coaching perspective and the officiating perspective? It kind of brought that along throughout your career. Well, I think the combination of coaching and officiating made me better at both um, and made both made both more enjoyable because you had what I would say kind of a um, larger picture of what was going on. And so that was always a, a big part of my coaching was to make sure that my athletes knew the rules because if you know the rules, you can play farther. You know, you can take it to the edge and still be playing within the spirit of the rules and the things like that. What I learned from my athletes was, oh my gosh, I, I, you know, it was just something new all the time. It was what their life was like, what their aspirations were. It helped me in my teaching because I could relate to them in a, a more of an informal way. And then that helped me when I was in the classroom uh, to, you know, to work with the, the young people and help them learn and hopefully appreciate just physical movement. Uh, some liked it and some, as you know, that's not their favorite thing to do. But the whole idea was uh, let's get you where you can, you can, you can appreciate it. You can move, you can do things and you don't have to be these tremendous athletes. You just need to kind of be physically active and can grow from there. And I, I think being with young people that helped and it always helped me. Uh, I think helped as a teacher, helped me as a, a teacher in the school community too. Um, you know, you name it. And my husband, Eric and I, we've taught the same high school, but you name it. And we were always involved with it at, at school. And I think a part of that was because we both coached and we had just a real strong connection with the kids and knew what things were important to them. What made you uh, decide to take the step to first being an athletic director? So kind of that step out of the classroom and to kind of enter the world of administration. Um, that's sort of a strange story. <laughs> uh, I, I thought at one point in time, I wanted to be a college track and field coach. So that, that was my, as you say, kind of my long-term goal. Uh, but then I had a superintendent that convinced me otherwise uh, to become the athletic director at, at the school, uh, at the high school. And uh, so we gave it a try and that led to getting into administration and kind of an assistant principal role as well, but I never gave up teaching. That that was part of the part of the deal. I would teach two hours a day and I could coach two sports. Um, if I couldn't do that, I wouldn't do the other. And so we had this agreement that as long as I was doing satisfactory work for the superintendent and my building principal, I could continue that schedule. And as long as I wanted that schedule, uh, I could keep it. And so that was really how we worked through it. And I I just enjoyed the organization. I, I enjoyed that I could hopefully improve the opportunities for the students in the school. And, and again, I go back to, I felt like I had a good, you know, a good feel of what, what did they like? And so kind of catered um, opportunities there for them and experiences that, that they would like that would give them good memories, good feelings about being in school, about being a, a Waynesville Tiger. So then when you joined the staff of the MSHSAA, um, how many other females were in leadership positions in the office at the time? Well, I was it. Okay. Uh, and uh, so it, it, it was a, you know, it, it was a, it was an experience, um, you know, to work with, uh, to get athletic administrators across the state and principals across the state to get used to working with a female in that role. Uh, to get used to when you're doing football playoffs and you're giving in their schedules and telling them what to do that, you know, if they didn't like it, they would say, well, let me talk to Jack. 
that with my boss, Jeff Miles. And I would say, well, no, this is my responsibility. And so here's what we have. But if you need something, you know, just let me know. And uh, so it, it, it was um, a learning experience, both for me and I think for the schools. But again, I go back is that I had really, really good people to work with in the office who quite honestly, um, they, you know, they, they had my ear, they had my back, they, they were teaching me how to be a good administrator, how to be a good, uh, what I would say, activities association administrator, do things the right way, and to also really understand the history and the philosophy of why we do what, what we do. You know that you, you speaking there reminds me of one of the things, I've learned a lot of lessons from you uh, and, and my time spent with you over the last almost, gosh, 20 years that we've known each other. Um, but one of the things that I have learned and I feel like I most uh, look up to is your excitement for learning new things and not just learning new things, but then teaching others about it. Where do you think that comes from? I think I was always surrounded by people that wanted to learn. Uh, I think I was primarily surrounded by people that were pretty happy. Uh, you know, they, they looked, you know, they enjoyed life. They enjoyed what they did. And that's the way I looked at it was that, uh, you know, by good graces, I was allowed to have different positions where if I kept my head on straight and really worked at it, I could contribute. And that was just what the way I sort of have looked at everything. I can help. I can contribute. I take care of our two granddaughters. And uh, the reason for doing that is I felt like, you know, I could contribute to their growing up and are trying to, you know, kind of what I would say, kind of teach the same things. A mentoring program is working with some really, really outstanding young individuals, but the opportunity to learn more, but share, you know, help them get a passion about something. So when they get ready to go out and, uh, you know, tackle the world, they're going to tackle it with passion. So being one of the um, kind of the first females in a lot of ways, as you, as you kind of climb the ranks of administration, did you have, uh, as you mentioned mentorship now, did you have any mentors? And I, they, they could be males, obviously, that's probably what you had as an opportunity, but did you have any mentors as you entered the, the realm of administration that you really leaned on in terms of learning from um, as you now can pass down in your mentorship program? Uh, I think so. And, you know, I, I would say this to anybody is if you limit yourself to I'm only going to use females or I'm only going to use males, you're only going to get half the opportunities that would come knocking at, at your door. You just surround yourself, uh, hopefully, with strong people and learn those things. So you become better at what, what you do. But I, I did. I, I think, you know, I have to say my mother was huge um, in what I did. And then my field hockey coach and my softball coach and my volleyball coach at, at the university were, they were all very strong women. They were all very uh, confident in what they did. They were very much of promoting the athlete as a full individual, not only how we played, but just how we were, you know, how we were growing up, what we were doing. So I think as you you go through, you find those individuals and administrators in school, there weren't very many females in school either, but you would find teachers, you would find coaches that we worked together. And then when I started with the association, um, you know, we, we always joke now about kind of the old group. Um, maybe I should say experience. That's probably the better way to, to put it. But there were several of us, uh, especially in Section 5, that we all started we started in the business together and we, we grew and we helped each other. We, you know, we had so many things in common and we, I think we became mentors and role models for, you know, for each other. And uh, you've had, I know many of those people have been featured in your title nine um, spots on, you know, on the social media. And, uh, but I, I think that's where you, you know, where you found people. And then I found people outside of, you know, outside of just the, the state association, with officials working with having the opportunity to work with other groups and finding individuals that, you know, would um, help teach you. I mean, you're a perfect example. Ah, we work together. You know, we, we work together. 
uh, the, the whole time. And that's the way I think, you know, I viewed it is um, I learned so many things just from working with you because you, you know, we, we talked and we shared different perspectives about things and, you know, cut it together could say, Hey, that's not a, that's not a half bad idea. We ought to try that. <laughs> Yeah, that's when I was kind of reflecting on even, you know, having this interview and having this conversation with you, I was thinking about the, the biggest lessons learned that I mentioned before, you're just joy for learning. Second, I would say, is your ability to serve your, your humbleness to surround yourself with people uh, that I don't want to say you always say we're smarter than you. I don't believe that. Um, but I think that you do have this ability to give others credit where credits do that not every leader has. Um, where do you think kind of that, that humbleness and attitude to surround yourself with positive people, uh, with people that you can rely on, um, where, where kind of that came from as you, as you grew up in administration? Well, I, I'd, have to, I'd have to say both my mom and dad, but especially my dad. You know, his, his what I would say is he kind of instilled in us that uh, everybody – deserves respect everybody has talents we just have to find them uh and nobody's better than anybody we we just you know we just all we just all find our place at a different time but have respect for everybody treat everybody with respect and as i became associated with different teachers different coaches different administrators i found that the people that i looked up to the most they shared similar type philosophies. I mean, Jack Miles, um, who was my boss at, at the Missouri Association, I couldn't have asked for a better person to work for or with. Uh, he is just a genuinely nice person. And he never got upset, which how he did that job and not get upset. I don't know. But no, he, he was really just, he just was a kind, sincere person and was always looking to make things right and better for the schools and, and for students. And, um, you know, we had some really good board members that were the same way, that were outstanding administrators. In fact, Al Burr was uh, served on the Federation board and was president at, at one point in time. And, uh, you know, had just, just this great philosophy of how you, you work with, you know, work with people. So I think that that's, you know, that's just where it started. And it, it's, I mean, we're in a, we're, we're in a service oriented business. Uh, you know, when I coach my, my responsibility really first and foremost is to teach young people. I teach them the game. I teach them maybe a little bit of philosophy of life. So they are, so they get the real benefit of, of participating when, uh, you know, when they leave the team, they have more skills, more tools in their, you know, in their basket, uh, to go through life. So, um, I think it just was a, it, it just, again, it, it just worked. It's just there. There, I, I don't, there isn't anything I've done that I don't do that for. Um, I don't, I kind of struggled with kind of the question about work-life balance because I feel like it's um, more heavily asked towards women than it is towards male. But I do think that, you know, when you started your career um, at the MSHSAA, uh, in the 80s and 90s and had a young daughter at home and, you know, a husband who had a career as well. Did you receive any pushback from kind of being a driven female leader uh, that others felt like you had a family? Maybe that should have been your responsibility. Sometimes, uh, you know, I think this is my, this is my perception. My perception is that when you run into folks like that, part of that is they're a little bit envious, um, you know, and what, what they're trying to do. You, you're not quite in, in the norm. You're, you're stretching their boundaries a little bit as well. You know, are they expected to do things? Again, I, my, my, the office staff I work with, both the support staff who had, I mean, there were a ton of moms in there. And they really were supportive of, you know, laugh at some of the things I would do to say, that's not how you do it. Try this. Um, but the office was, was, um, was very tight knit, was very supportive. And the same thing, of course, we didn't have a job when I, you know, I was teaching and coaching, but I think you, you got that. But again, is, I think that's how I was brought up and the people I was with and the coaches, I, a lot of the coaches was don't ever sell yourself short. 
you know, you, you can do what you want to do. You can make, you can make things work. And uh, what I was, I always call it the laundry method. I could tell where my schedule was the busiest as to what time of the day or night I would do my laundry and I could go back. I could tell you the truth. I could tell you at different times when our daughter was growing up, you know, late night was laundry time. No, no, no. Early morning was laundry time. You know, you just had to find it. to So you had your built in time to work with family. But the, the best advice I, I ever received, um, it, it, you know, my parents told me you have kids to love them. So love them. And then uh, Al, um, Al Burr, who I mentioned uh, earlier, said there will come a time when I became executive director. He said there will come a time when you're going to retire and people will ask you, is there anything that you regret? And he said, don't be one of those administrators that says, I regret that I didn't spend enough time with my family. And I think that that was it. It was like, not, that's not going to happen. That's not going to be, you know, one of my one of my regrets. And the, I feel very comfortable that as we worked and everything with our family, we we made it work. And there are no regrets that we didn't spend time and have that have that good balance. But I also have to say that I have a great husband. Uh, you know, and so we we're a you know we're a great team. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that, what that meant at the time um, to have such a supportive husband who uh, who you know, not just allowed you uh, to pursue your career, but encouraged you and had your back through it all. Um, well, extremely important. And, you know, Eric's not one of those type of men that says, oh, you know, this is this is the stereotype. This is what you need to do or this is what you need to do. Uh, I've told a story and I'm sure you've heard it was we were uh, scheduled to be married and um, we were also uh, the softball team I was with at college at the university. They were playing in the, the uh, World Series championship and there was rain delay, rain delay, rain delay. But we, we were going to play in the championship game and it was the week of our wedding and uh, it kept getting closer to the wedding day and still having rain and so there was the possibility that well I wasn't going to do both of them maybe so uh my my conversation with Eric is you know well if it doesn't happen you know I'll come home and we'll ha have our wedding and he you know it's just point blank oh no 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 he goes we're not doing that he goes I'm not living with that that you married me and never got to play in that ball game he goes I'd never hear the end of it he goes we can get married anytime uh, but it turned out that we got son, played the game and got married also. So it, it was good. But that's that's a perfect I couldn't sum it up any better. That's a perfect example of I'm with you. I know what means a lot to you. It means a lot to me because it means a lot to you. And, you know, we'll just you know, you just make it work. When you look back on your career uh, and your list of accomplishments, what stands out to you the most in terms of what you're most proud of? in work. Mm -hmm. Oh, wow. Um, wow. You can say me and who I am today, if you would like to say Well, that. you actually <laughs> are pretty, uh, pretty high up there on the, on the list. I brag about you more than you probably ever know. Um, you know, I, can I, is it just one thing? Is that? No, you uh, can, this, this is your show. As, as many as you need. <laughs> well, I, I don't want to do that, but I, I, I think, um, I think I can almost put it in, in uh, like segments of where I, you know, when I work, I think in the, in the schooling and everything, I, I think the biggest thing was, is that I, created opportunities and supported supported opportunities for a lot of different kids to be involved and the school district where I taught and coach it was a military school and civilian but we had a lot of uh, what I would say kids that had challenging home lives and um, some of the some of the teachers and coaches weren't real weren't real keen to put up with some of the issues that, that were, you know, that were there. Um, but I think that the way I approached it 
we had all kinds of kids that were in my programs and um, we learned how to deal with things and respect their different cultures because they came from all over the world. And so it wasn't make you like me. It was, I'll respect your culture. Here's why we need to do this because this is what will help us be successful and, you know, win the game or whatever the case may be. So I, I think that that's what I would look at kind of the teaching and coaching um, that really stands out at Misha. Um, I think the biggest mm -hmm. accomplishments were we made so many strides in sportsmanship uh, and we, we worked our schedules um, that we created uh, what I would say opportunities for schools to step forward, to show that, if they had a violation, they, they would self-report. And people would say, oh, they don't do that. They do that. If you, if you encourage them along the way and you let them take part in the decision-making of what should take place. So I think that's what I would look at is, is kind of the encouragement and seeing that we had lots of sportsmanship and lots of integrity uh, within the program. And you could go on of opportunities and where we played tournaments and everything. But I think those two things really were – extremely important and and I think are the are the foundation of why we do what we do coming to the federation um I think probably one of the most rewarding and there were many but one of the most rewarding was the inclusion program 